Before we get going, just a few housekeeping announcements. I have to do the fun stuff, alhamdulillah. So for those of you that are registered, we have about, alhamdulillah, about 135 people registered from all over the country. We have people right now visiting, students from Virginia, from Washington, D.C. We have people from all over the country, alhamdulillah. We have an entire family from Phoenix, Arizona that came. They drove. So you should feel very fortunate that this is in your own backyard for those of you that are from this community. So if you still would like to register, after the program, inshallah, you can come register if there are spots or tomorrow morning. Tomorrow morning, we'll begin promptly with registration at 8 a.m. Uh, and we'll have full breakfast, uh, uh, complimentary breakfast for all the registrants tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock. And we'll bring, begin promptly with Sheikh Suhaib's lecture at 9 a.m. So please come bright-eyed and bushy-tailed and happy and ready to go. And there will be coffee for sale by uh, Rahma Cafe. So do not you know, go to Starbucks, don't go to Coffee Bean. Come and purchase from the masjid and support your masjid, inshallah. Uh, and, and we'll learn more about the logistics uh, tomorrow morning, inshallah. But so everyone else that's registered should know to be here tomorrow between 8 and 9. They want breakfast at 9 o'clock sharp. We'll start with Sheikh Suhaib. Inshallah, I want to introduce uh, the executive director of Alim, uh, Brother Muhammad Yahya. Uh, he is going to start us off tonight. Uh, Brother Muhammad Haraldez is an entrepreneur and an investor in digital technology and fashion. As a student of Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, Muhammad has studied Sharia for four years in countries such as Syria, Mor Morocco, and Mauritania. And as I mentioned, he is currently the executive director of Alam. Many of you have heard him. He spoke one night at this masjid before. So, inshallah, uh, Brother Muhammad Yahya. Bismillah. Uh, my name is Muhammad Haraldez. I'm the executive director of Alim organization. The um, Alim organization is nearly started about nearly 15 years ago in Michigan. It's comprised of three core scholars, Dr. Ali, Dr. Jackson, and Dr. Fareed, none of them who are sitting here right now. Dr. Fareed, uh, his plane was diverted to Las Vegas, so he's on the road right now to here. Dr. Jackson is here in the building. He'll be coming to sit here in the front and Dr. Ali is not able to be with us, he's in Michigan. Basically, uh, just give a brief overview really quickly about what Alim is and you know, what we try to do. Alim, what we try to produce and what we try to do is bridge the Muslim and American identity through Islamic literacy, right? So we have the American and Muslim identity and bridging that through Islamic literacy, this, which is a phrase that we coined. Islamic literacy is the establishment and critical engagement of the requisite intellectual and spiritual realities or foundations of Islam. So it's the critical establishment and critical engagement of the intellectual as well as spiritual foundations of Islam. What Islam teach, or what, uh, 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 what at Alam, what we try to do is we try to teach Muslims to be grounded in their tradition, in their faith. By being able to be grounded in their tradition and in their faith, but also can contextualize this within the American social, political, cultural, and intellectual realities. So, so that's what we try to do at Alam. That's how we go about creating Islamically literate Muslims, American Muslims who are grounded in their tradition, but who are able to contextualize all of that with the, within the socio political, cultural, intellectual realities of American life. And we do this through our programs here. We do it through our winter programs, through our summer programs, and having our guest scholar, Imam Suhaib Webb, with us is a delight for us. I'm going to go quickly go over, give you the titles of what they're going to be doing uh, the program on. So this is open to the public and starting tomorrow will be the program where you have to register. We only have like 15 seats left. There is a live stream though that's going on. So if you're not able to make it for whatever reason, we have a live stream going. So the three topics that will be covered, three sessions tomorrow along with an artist panel. By Imam Suhaib Webb, the title of his sessions will be The Legitimacy of American Islam, A Look at Scripture, History, and Scholarly Opinion. Dr. Jackson will be doing Muslims, Islamic Law, 
and the socio-political reality in the United States. Dr. Freed will be doing art, the avant-garde of the new spirituality. So with that, I'm going to give it back to Muiz, or am I going to I'm going to introduce the president of our board of trustees, Mahmoud Said, who was, who was the vice president of HR at Sharp San Diego Hospital in San Diego. He was once the executive director for the Nawawi Foundation of Dr. Omar Abdullah, and he is currently the president of the board of trustees for Alam, Mahmoud Said. Uh, I understand sitting in the audience you're very excited to have our, uh, our scholars speak to us so I'm not going to take too much time. One point of clarification for anybody who is from San Diego, it's actually Rated Children's Hospital not Sharp Healthcare. I don't want that going out because you know my peer at Sharp Healthcare might think I'm trying to take his job and I'm not trying to do that just yet at least. Um, and also what I also want to recognize is only in Southern California would I be wearing a wool jacket when it's like below 45. I mean, what is it, like 55 outside? And here I'm wearing a jacket. It's, I feel cold. I'm actually a Midwest transplant from Wisconsin and the Chicagoland area. Been in Southern California now for three years. Uh, and I'm very fortunate and honored uh, to be the president of the Board of Trustees at Adam. Been involved with Adam since its inception as a volunteer. And on behalf of the entire board, that includes our three scholars that Muhammad Yahya spoke about, but also a number of other scholar, a uh, number of other individuals on the board, including uh, Aisha Hussein, uh, Shirin Khan, uh, Hamad Suhaib, um, Saqib Rizvi, Yusuf Hai, and myself. Uh, I want to thank all of you uh, for coming tonight. I most importantly want to thank Imam Muzammar Siddiqui and the Islamic Society of Orange County for hosting us uh, for our. 10th annual winter program. Uh, this is a great honor for us to be here in Southern California after about three or four years ago when we were here last. Uh, this is a great opportunity for us to be able to share with you uh, what we believe to be a very unique product uh, within the landscape of Muslim organizations that really is not only about today but changes the landscape of the future of Islam in America. And that is what we're going to hear about today. But again, in closing, in closing what I want to do again is very much thank our host tonight and thank all of you for coming. And Jazakumullah uh, khair. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you, Brother Matmoon. Inshallah, without further ado, I want to introduce uh, our moderator tonight. It will not be me, alhamdulillah. It will be our very own uh, Sheikh Suhail Mullah. Uh, who is the Assistant Religious Director here at the Islamic Society of Orange County. Uh, he is a recent graduate of Al-Azhar University. He has a very, very uh, prestigious background. He has his degree in African American Studies uh, from Cal State Northridge and his Master's in Social Work and worked for a number of years as a counselor in the LA County uh, or in the LAUSD school system. So we're very, very honored to have him as our Imam. Uh, inshallah, uh, Sheikh uh, Suha Mullah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu salam ala rasulillah. Wallah, it's a pleasure and honor to be here, and especially amongst and amidst uh, so many be beautiful personalities. And we have people, alhamdulillah, who came from the Mashriq and the Maghrib and everywhere in between. Uh, we have uh, our scholarship that spans all the way from, from Egypt to Saudi to India and, and everywhere else in between. And we're very fortunate to have um, such wonderful people with us here today. And uh, it's my honor as always and pleasure to first um, ask and introduce our own uh, religious director, the religious director of is the Islamic Society of Orange County for the last 30 plus years, who really needs no introduction. But uh, you know, just to remind everybody of the blessing that we have with having um, this particular gentleman and scholar in our community, uh, Dr. Muzammar Siddiqui, he, is a, he received his early education in Nadwatul Ulama in India. And he went from there and did his higher degree studies in uh, Medina, Islamic University of Medina, and went from there to Birmingham, England, and did his, uh, his degree, his master's in theology, and from there to Harvard University uh, in comparative religion where he received his doctorate. 
And of course, all of us know the, the um, tremendous amount of service that he's provided to the local Southern California area and as well as throughout the, na the nation. So we want to ask uh, Dr. Muzamal, inshallah, to say a few words for us today. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. Uh, it's really a pleasure for me to see all of you here this evening, mashallah, uh, to come for a very, very important program. So I welcome all of you and especially welcome our scholars and dear brothers, uh, Sheikh Suhaib. Uh, mashallah, may Allah SWT bless him and reward him for all the good work that he has been doing and all the learning that he has done. Uh, Dr. Sherman Jackson, who is now, mashallah, in Southern California, so we are very happy to have him here uh, in, uh, at USC, where he is heading the Islamic Studies program. And Dr. Munir Farid, mashallah, he served many years at the Islamic Society of North America as the Secretary General. He is a professor of Islamic studies and mashallah he is part of this program. So you see the wealth of knowledge. Uh, I was telling you this uh, after Juma prayer. Uh, this is an old saying in Urdu. Uh, you know in the old days people used to go to the well or to the spring to get the water. So we say Piyasa kuen ke paas jata hai. The thirsty person goes to the well to seek the, to get the water. But now we see the well is coming uh, to the thirsty people. Huh? So it's nice to see that the spring is coming here. So you don't have to go to the spring, but you have to see the spring is coming. So this is a mobile institute, mashallah, moves from place to place and getting this, uh, spreading the knowledge. And uh, it's very, very important to t take advantage of this kind of opportunities, mashallah. These uh, brothers traveling all the way from Boston and from... Uh, uh, USC, it's a long way, eh? <laughs> and then also coming from South Africa. So you see that long uh, people have come from all different areas to teach you. Alim is uh, the word that means the one who knows. And there are different levels of knowledge. So one has to keep on growing and increasing one's knowledge. And Imam Ghazali says it very nicely, he says the alim, ilm has two meanings. One meaning of the ilm is, idrakul ashya ikama hiya. One is that you know things as they are. So understand the reality of things. So better the knowledge, the more you know the facts. And the more you know things as they are. And the other meaning of ilm is, which is really very, very important aspect of Islamic way of understanding. Islamic way of knowledge is Al-ilm ma yu'asru fi nafs And this is from alama That is alam Something that is a sign So al-ilm ma yu'asru fi nafs The ilm is that changes the personality That make the people better people And so both of these aspects are there And mashallah these uh, scholars are going to speak and address Very important issues Important issues is how we should live here uh, in this society, uh, beneficial to the society and as well as beneficial to ourselves and uh, understand the facts of Islam and the facts of the society and see how we can relate. So this issue of contextualization and understanding the, the, the context in which we are, social context, economic context, political concept, context, all different kind of contexts, understanding them and then at the same time be effective effective in ourselves, in our families, in our communities and beneficial for the society at large. So I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to benefit all of us and we get inshallah from these uh, uh, speakers, from their knowledge and learn inshallah. Jazakumullahu khair. Assalamu alaikum wa barakatuh. So inshallah Without uh, further ado, and we don't want to spend too much time with the in-between uh, comments and, and so on, um, we'd like to get to the meat of the matter, inshallah. Uh, Imam Suhaib Webb is our first speaker, inshallah. And Imam Suhaib Webb, a dear friend, 
um, uh, a dear brother, somebody who I spent much time with in Egypt and who I love for the sake of Allah. And he um, received his, his bachelor's degree in Sharia from Al-Azhar University in Cairo, Egypt. He did an ifta course there also in, uh, for Dar al-Ifta al-Misriya, uh, which is the highest body that issues fatwa and that uh, is in charge of religious edict, uh, putting out religious edicts and so forth. He was in charge of the English translation uh, session, uh, section there. He is, of course, very well versed in alim in the Maliki tradition. And he um, currently lives in Boston. So when we lost Imam Suhaib, alhamdulillah, we took in exchange Dr. Jackson. So al-ulama, sometimes they come and sometimes they go. And uh, we, we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for, for blessing us with so many beautiful people to, um, to learn from. He's now the Imam at the Islamic Society of the Boston Cultural Center. And he is the founder and instructor of Ella Collins Institute. Uh, with no further ado, uh, Dr. Uh, Imam Sohib Web. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of God, the most gracious, the most merciful. Wa usali wa usalim ala sayyid al-awwaleen. We send peace and blessings upon uh, our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I just have to say that you got the good end of that bargain. We got ripped off with Dr. Jackson being here. We should get him in Boston, I think, if that's the deal. I didn't know about that. You, you got the good end of the stick on that one. Um, alhamdulillah, it's great to be here with uh, Dr. Sherman, who's our teacher, one of our mentors, um, one of our imams. We see him as an imam. Many of you see him as a professor, a doctor, but for those of us in the trenches, um, in communities around the country, you know, you are one of our imams. You know, the one yuqtadu bihi. And, and then, of course, Dr. Muzammil uh, is a giant, you know, is, is, in, is indeed, you know, kashams, yamshi ala wajil ard, as we say. You know, he's like a sun that walks on the earth. For jazakallah khairan for everything that you've done and you contribute to continue to do. And then Sheikh Suhail, um, who is a great scholar that you have here amongst you, someone who has qualified himself. You know, I've seen him do some really incredible things in studies and his learning. And then, of course, Dr. Munir, who's not here, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless all of them. And what I, what I plan to address over the next uh, few days is really talking about the legitimacy uh, of American Islam. And for many people, that immediately creates kind of a problem. So we hope to be able to kind of address maybe why that happens and why there might be definitely some legitimate concerns around that, but how uh, hopefully we can insha'Allah ta'ala create some kind of comfortability around understanding not only the legitimacy but the necessity. So we'll start with the legitimacy and then once we make ithbat of the haqiqah, once we've established the reality uh, based on our traditions and our texts and our body of scholarly work, then we need to leave the petty discussions about legitimacy because at 40 years old, I simply don't have the bandwidth to keep talking about that anymore. And it's now time to be ijabi, to be positive and start building things um, and create institutions that would reflect um, that. You know, as one of my teachers said, when you learn, you become confident. And Islam, as I said today, Allah didn't say, إِذَا دَعَاكُمْ لِمَا يُمِيتُكُمْ the Prophet didn't say, Allah didn't say that the Prophet calls you to what will kill you. He said, yuhyikum. He calls you to what will give you ihya, to give you life in the fullest sense of the word. So in doing so, we're going to look at scripture. And I'll give you just a few appetizers because tomorrow is the main program. But when we look at the Quran, we find that there are universal principles that the Quran teaches. And, and those are extracted by a method of stiqra. The scholars would see continual patterns throughout the Qur'an. And some of them said, stiqra Sayyidul Adillah. You know, there's a statement by some that that method is actually the master of all evidences because it's a quantitative proof based on, you know, thousands of minds are coming to the same conclusion who live in different areas in different places. But one of them is that we have to articulate uh, a religion in a 
way that's understandable and palatable to the people who live around us. This might sound, you know, somewhat <coughs> mundane, but I'll give you an example. You know, when people take Shahada in Boston, they take Shahada in English. You're going to ask people to say the Shahada in Arabic, and usually when someone does it, the first question I get is, was their Shahada valid? And then I'll ask why, and they say, well, they didn't say it in Arabic. So I, I said to one brother, and I said it humorously, he was a friend of mine, I said, the man who just accepted Islam, if I t told him, you know, Ashhadu, Ashhadu, in Nani, in Nani, Balidun, Balidun, Jiddin, you know, I bear witness that I'm dumb. Right? Actually, yeah, acutely stupid, right? It would be a word for it. And I want to go buy, you know, some eggplant outside. And no one in the audience understood what I said, and he didn't understand what I said, and then what I said, and then he took shahada in English. Would his shahada still be valid or not? And he said, I really don't know how to answer that question. He said, Well, Zakalo Khair. We see that when a person converts to Islam, immediately they're subjected to cultural, I would say, assault. Their names are changed. I was named after my great-grandfather, who was a great person in my family, who was a, a very uh, gifted farmer, right? I told my mother I changed my name. She began to cry. How could you change the name that we gave you? You're named after your grandfather. I said, that's a kafir. Right? Then we change our dress. We change how we talk. We change how we eat. I didn't eat hot sauce with baked potatoes in the past. And, and, and not all of that's bad. Some of that is out of the beauty and the, the pluralism that Islam teaches us, right? But when it's forced, and as I said today in the khutbah, when we're living vicariously through converts, or vicariously we're living our Islam through a young generation of Muslims, and then we're expecting them to be empowered to speak to a society that's rooted in completely different cultural norms and constructs, we're going to be creating a problem. So if we look at the Qur'an, is there some source material that allows us to spit, and I'm saying that on purpose, the language of the people. And we look at the, and I'm actually working on a tafsir of this, the last part of the Qur'an is actually really incredible. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in, in, in some situations he alludes to things that are so obvious to the Arabic Arab culture at the time of the Prophet وسلم, that he doesn't even go into explaining it. It's like, you know, we say in slang, man, I knew that, man. So Allah says, Li ila fi Quraysh. Li ila fi Quraysh is an alam. It's an event that took place. And it's interesting when, you, when you, I was sitting with a teacher in Azhar, and, and you know, we study tafsir with a person that's really cool. And he was saying, you know, why is it saying it like that? And why does it start with harful jar? You know, and this is lam, lam ta'lil, according to some of them, because of the security of the Quraysh. As though this is something already known, and excuse me, I understand it's an academic environment, forgive me, I'm from Boston, you know. But it's like it's already known in the hood, B. And, and I liken it to this. I liken it to anyone who's gone to a barber shop. And you're getting, you know, like your hair done. So what happened was, if you look at old poetry, pre, is you know, pre, you know, pre-Islam, you find that they used to talk about, man, why do these Quraysh have it good? They live in the worst neighborhood in the Jazeera. Anyone who's been to Mecca, be honest, as soon as you saw it, you're probably environmentally challenged. You might have begun to remember all of the survival shows you watched on like FX or Discover. You know, what do I do if I get lost in the desert? What do bear growls do? Can I crack a rock and make water come out? You know, can I eat a scorpion? Because it's a tough place. I remember once I was in the Gulf countries and I was walking to Thor and I started to get dizzy from the heat. Right? It's a very uncomfortable place. And that was something on the Elsina of the Sha'ara. And the Sha'ara were the NPR of the age. They were the CNN of the Jazeera. They were the Jay-Z of their era. They were the people who had the ears of the masses. Right? So they would talk about in their poetry, how is it, and even they would make fun of the Quraysh. It was like a diss rap, like a mixtape would come out. And they would come after the Quraysh and say, 
man, look where you live. And it was something that they would kind of were amazed about. And they would even attribute it to the bark of Sayyidina Ibrahim. That they have ilaf. How do they have security? So when Allah says, for or because of the security of the Quraysh, if you were in the Arabian barbershop at that time, and you were getting your stuff edged up or faded, right? And you said to your barber, li ila Quraysh, li ila fi Quraysh. You know what he would have said to you? Man, I always wondered about that. Man, I always wondered about that. And that was the reaction of the Arabs when they heard this verse. Yeah, man, we thought about that. Like, how come they have ilaf? And this is the beauty of the Quran. It takes a cultural phenomenon and employs it to bring people closer to God. It's not intimidated by culture. It's empowered by culture. And it can flip culture to bring people into it. Because when you use people's cultures, you usually, unless you're going at them hard, comfort them. But it continues. Surah Al-Bayna. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls the Prophet Al-Bayna sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Dhakara al-sifa bila mawsufiha. He mentions an adjective without mentioning the noun. This is strange for us. If I say the clear proof is sitting outside in the parking lot. Brother, what are you talking about? Clear proof? We're Muslims now. We don't mess with clear proof. Not that. Right? <laughs> so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and this happens a lot in the Quran, He will mention something without mentioning, He'll mention an adjective without mentioning the noun it describes. Because you don't need to. If we're watching the Celtics and the Lakers, and I say the greatest ever, we all know it's KG. And I know you agree with me. Exactly. But on the Rilla, if we're watching the Lakers and we said, you know, the best player, everybody's going to assume we mean Kobe. We already know. We don't need to go into discussion. We're culturally aware of what we're talking about. And this is the beauty of the Quran. <laughs> Until the bayna comes to you. Because they already knew. يَعْرِفُونَهُ كَمَا يَعْرِفُونَ أَبَنَاءَهُمْ they knew the Prophet as they knew their children. They knew that someone was coming. So Allah says, al bayina And he doesn't mention, Al-Rasul huwa al bayina Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Again, it was something that was part of their, and I want you to pay attention to these three points. Their cultural, we mentioned that, li ila fi Quraysh. Now their spiritual realities. They were waiting for a Prophet. In fact, some of the ulama of history say that the Jewish community moved to Medina primarily because they were expecting a prophet to come there. They were expecting their Messiah to come from Medina. Third is popular culture. And for some reason, Muslims, we like to diss on popular culture. And there's definitely aspects of popular culture we should not be involved in, of course. But I believe the du'at, you know, one time I asked Imam Siraj Wahaj, what's the most important thing after, like, religious texts that I could have? He said, an almanac. This is in the 90s. He said, study an almanac. Know people. Know what they're thinking. Appreciate them. And I said it, and people didn't understand it. I said it as kind of an embellishment. I said, everybody who comes to America to be an imam should watch ESPN, Nickelodeon, and CNN and Fox News for one year before they get on the minbar. And Ella Collins Institute... In our imam training, we actually have a section that you have to go to the newspaper or see something on TV or some external experience. And that has to be part of your khutbah. You have to make the newspaper work on the mimbar. Your app needs to work on the mimbar. Because the people that you are speaking to have been educated differently. So we see now popular culture. Allah says, وَالْعَادِيَاتِ ضَبَحَا Al-adiyat again is a, a, a sifa wa mawsufuha mahdufa. It's an adjective whose noun is not described. Adiyat means something yamur bisura, something that moves quickly. But it's not talked about because the Arabs already knew what time it was. There was no need for a long discussion. But you find the Sahaba, this beautiful, you know, a difference amongst Ali radiallahu anhu and Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma about the meaning of it, but most of them said it's camels. Others said it's horses. 
Those who said it was horses are the majority. Those who said it the camels are minority. But I have a question for you. And I'm from the 90s, so forgive this rather outdated example. But like an Impala up on Crenshaw on Saturday night, back in the days, right? That was the equivalent of a horse to an Arab. Read Antara's poetry. Antara talks about his horse like Biggie talks about his car. It's true. He even talks about how, while he was fighting with his horse, and he was a, 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 you know, a great poet before the time of the Prophet how even the blood, the warm blood will come down the neck of his horse while he's holding on to the bridle of the horse. I mean, can Yosef al-Khayl, you know, he describes the horse, I'm telling you, like Pac would talk about a car. Because it doesn't change. The objects change, the verbs stay the same. Don't forget that. So Allah says, وَالْعَادِيَاتِ الضَّبَحَا So here we see three important things. Number one, لِإِلَىٰ فِي قُرَيْشْ is, is an, an event that really shook people. Number two, al-bayna is a spiritual reality. And then al-adiyat is a spiritual reality. The entire culture of the Arabs is alluded to in about the last, you know, part of the Qur'an. And we extract from that, and it continues all throughout the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching us that as a universal, articulate, divine teachings and precepts in a way that people can understand. What unfortunately some of us have done is thought that no, we have to give the message and the clothing that came with it its cultural clothing, in this case, an Arab cultural reality that existed 1400 years ago into America. So we forgot the major principle, and that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is encouraging us to communicate the message in a way that employs the cultural realities that we live in, whether intellectual cultural realities, whether spiritual cultural realities, or whether dealing with pop culture. I'll give you one example. How many of you have read the story of Omar accepting Islam? Every single one of us. What year did he accept Islam? The sixth year. Watch this and tell me if it works. Have you ever thought about what Omar's conversion meant to society? Because what did Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu anhu say? He said, before Omar became Muslim, we couldn't really... Umar was a walking human rights organization, man. We, we couldn't go out and worship God before Umar's Islam. And if you ever thought about looking in the books of Sirah, like, you know, the books of Ibn Ishaq and Ibn Hisham, and read what the Quraysh said when Umar became Muslim, what their reactions were to his acceptance of Islam. You know, it was like, did you hear... What happened? It was like TMZ, man. Why did you laugh when I said TMZ? I did it on purpose. Because I brought you closer to it. But watch this. Watch this and put on your seatbelt. You know what I like in Omar's conversion to? Magic's announcement that he had AIDS. What did that just do to you? No one forgot that. I remember I walked in my house. My mother was in the kitchen. She said, baby, magic got AIDS. I said, Ma what? Who's magic? Then I saw him. What color was the suit he had on? It was a blue suit with a white shirt. And the reaction of society was, man, magic got AIDS, B. I went to play basketball that afternoon. We barely got to play because everyone was like, did you hear about Irvin Magic Johnson? I'm not comparing accepting Islam to AIDS, that would be short-sighted. I'm talking about the reaction of society to an event. And that's how we should teach Sirah. Did it do something for you now? You say, man, I never thought about it. Wow. And those of you who experienced remembered it. So we find that through the Quran, and we'll talk about this, and we'll get into examples of the Prophet, the necessity. Why did Allah say, Ala basiratin. The Prophet calls Ala Basira. Imam Ibn Qayyim said, Basira is Ma'rifatun Nusus wa Ma'rifatun Nas. Ibn, Ibn Qayyim said that Basira means to know the religious texts and to know people. Then we'll get into the scholarly opinions about needing to know folks, man. When 
Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal radiyallahu anhu was asked about the conditions of mufti. One of the conditions he said is to know the people. Imam al-Qarafi, he articulated in ikmal very beautiful, but beautifully that if someone comes to you and they're asking you a culture, which is a question, excuse me, which is rooted in culture and you don't know their culture, don't answer. And he said, if you answer, you should lose your license as a mufti. I studied that in Dar Ifta, and I lived it. In Egypt, no offense to the Egyptians, I'm Ahlawi. But not really. More like galaxy. But when people would come to Dar Ifta, and they heard, Hunak, it's a dude from America, be you Jeep. So they were like, let's go to him. So all the Egyptians would end up kind of in my area. I said, look, I don't do that. What you can do, go down the hall, is a sheikh from Mulufi, Mulufi, Salamu Qalim al Rabbi Rahim. Go to him because he knows you. I don't know what you're talking about. One day I was sitting and I got a phone call. First few months there, Sheikh Ahmed Shalabi, he's a master in inheritance, great mufti. He said, Suhaib, come downstairs now. So when they say now, now is now. I went down there. Who do you think I saw? White dude from Florida. Hey, man, what's up? What's going on? Do what's happening. <laughs> and Sheikh said, Wallahi ma fahim shayi haga. Sheikh said, I don't understand anything this guy's asking me, man. You answer the question. I said, what's going on? You know, I want to marry an Egyptian woman, Imam Shafi. I said, I don't want to hear that part. Right? But he had an issue that was rooted in a cultural reality that we face here. And that is marrying a woman from a different culture and bringing her back home to the south and having to explain to Baba Mama, what's up? I answered this question. We took care of him. A month later, phone, phone rings again. Sheikh Muhammad Wissam. He's that Amid of Iftar. You know, he's the guy after Sheikh Ali Juma. So, hey, I need you in my office right now. I go in there. Here's a sister from America. She has a question rooted in America. He said, so, hey, I can't answer this question. Can you take her and please listen to what she needs? The last question that I ever asked one of the muftis that I trained with was a question about a convert. A situation had arisen here, and we'll talk about that, inshallah, in a few days. Uh, and I asked him the question. And he said to me, I trained you to answer your people's problems. Answer. And stop bothering me. I have a Thora to worry about. I have a revolution on my hands, brother. Right? And I said, but I'm just a... He said, no, you are someone I taught. Answer the question. And you know your people, quote, better than I do. So answer. The other thing that we'll discuss are axioms. You know, it's, it's often not talked about, and I believe there should be a curriculum for Muslims just based on qawait. We should teach people sometimes these principles of Islam. We have principles that govern thought and principles that govern actions. One of the most beautiful principles in the, the, the Sadat Malikiya, which is mentioned in Khalil's famous text in al hafiz al-Dusuqi, he elaborates on it a lot, is al-urfu kashart. Al-urfu kashart. That custom is like a condition. Custom means, very beautifully, it means, ma yazimu bi adamihi al-adam wa la yalzimu bi wujudihi al-wujud. Which means that if it's not present, the reality can't be present. So the Malikis in many situations, especially, and I'll give one example, in the chapters of rent, ijara, you find this a lot. And a Dusuki, uh, Arafa Dusuki, he talks about in his Hashia, which is beautiful. I believe it should be studied sometimes more than the Mutun, because you find this creativity of a Dusuki, rahimahullah. He said, you know, he said, I'll give you an example. What now, ulama qad taghiru fatwa? You know, changing a fatwa because of certain realities, and one of them is the culture 
or customs of people. And we'll talk about tomorrow uh, a great Hanafi scholar from Egypt. And this is powerful. The first PhD ever done in Azhar was on Urf. The first PhD that was ever done and defended and received the Alamiya certification in the 20s by Abi Sunnah al Hanafi was on the concept of how culture affects fatwa. And how does culture not only affect fatwa, affect how we articulate our religion because we don't want to over fatwaize also our ummah. I feel this is another problem that we have. Everything needs a fatwa. Everything doesn't need a fatwa. Right? But he said that, you know, in the early days, we didn't pay people to teach Quran to our kids. Because everybody was being paid by the state. And in fact, he said, in Aqd al Ijma, he said, in the madhab, we had a consensus that it was not allowed to pay anybody for teaching the Quran. He says, And he said, but as for these days of ours, there's no one to pay them anymore. The government, unfortunately, you know, took a, an exit off the highway somewhere. And they stopped paying them. And he said, He said, this is an example of the changing of a fatwa based on certain parameters. And he used the word, تغييرو. And one of them he mentioned later on in the Hashia is culture, cultural norms. And I'll give you one example. A convert to Islam comes to us and says, can I pray in the bathroom? It's not really urf, but something that we'll talk about. Most of us will say, A'udhu billah, Right? Where's this person's brains? I took this question to a mufti in Egypt, who I studied with. He said, Sheikh, we got a sister, man. And I got hit hard. Someone said, Suhaib said, you know, these things are not allowed. People didn't take the time to understand, as you said, what I actually said. They allowed their emotions to infarjat al-awatif, you know, they exploded. He said, what's her situation? I said, Sheikh, her parents may physically harm her. He said, no, no, okay, that's, 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 uh, that's an already an understandable thing. He said, but listen to his question. Will they kick her out of the house? I said, yeah. He said, well, in your, in your country, you don't have, like, masajid are not, are not equipped yet institutionally. They don't have the institutional capacity to house women. I was like, no, they don't. He's like, well, could they afford to maybe put her or place her in a place of residence? I said, not really, and also it would be, like, a lot of stress to be separated from her parents and to, you know, hemorrhage a relationship, to create an aneurysm so early into her Islam. He said, tell her that according to the madhab, what she has to do is pray on something clean. Have a towel or something that's pure. Put it on the ground. Make sure that she doesn't touch anything where she is sure that there is filth. Close the toilet. And in this situation, he said, I allow her to pray the, the prayers which you have to say out loud, silently. I said, Sheikh, how did you do that? He said, that's why I'm the Sheikh, B. <laughs> so, and then he said, common sense, man. Common sense. Because if she doesn't pray, her iman will go weak. And then he said to me, you know what this is like? I said, what? He said, like the opinion of Marik, rahimahullah, about a woman who needs to touch, a woman, even Hazm and others, a woman who needs to touch the Qur'an, even though she's on her menses, because she's losing her iman. In that situation, we allowed it, because her iman takes precedence. He said, do you want another? They give you the furu, yeah, this is what they do. I said, yeah, drop it, Sheikh, keep going, just, I'm writing. I was like, this is incredible, just go. He said, also for a sister, who lives in a community where the only place she can come and study is the masjid. And she's ha'ab. And she's in her menses. He said, I allow her in the West, in the West, or any place where they are accepting Islam in numbers, or they have a weak community that needs to be educated. They do not have female scholarship. And he said this, I allow her to enter the masjid for the purpose of studying and to leave based on a hadith, he said, which is not super strong nor super weak that a shawkani mentions in his book that the companions of the Prophet's wives, and in particular he mentions Ummu Hatu Mu'minin, the wives of Sayyid al awwalin would enter the masjid, for example, Sauda bin Zama, to clean the masjid 
even though she was on her menses, because cleaning the masjid was a haja, was a need. And I said, Sheikh, how'd you do that? Because I'm the Sheikh B. Got it. But in that one sitting, you know, it begins with the original opinion of the school where Ibn uh, Dasuki mentions how the fatwa changed. In fact, you know what he said? In the early days, there was a consensus that it wasn't allowed. But because times have changed, there's a consensus that we have to pay them. SubhanAllah, Shaykh, the hukum completely transforms itself. Now in America, this becomes important because we have issues where we have a plurality of opinion. And we should be able to respect different opinions according to our different cultural realities in our community. For example, dogs. Many of us are not rolling with dogs. And children to go home tonight and say, Imam Suhaib Web said, Dad, I want a beagle. Right? So I'm saying, you negotiate that. It doesn't need a fatwa. Real talk. But if we find, in, and I'm trained in the Maliki tradition, so forgive me for not mentioning other traditions. That's my weakness. But we find in the Maliki madhab a very strong disagreement. And a very enriching discussion about allowing people to have domesticated dogs vis-a-vis -vis wild dogs. And a legitimate discussion, Al-Hattab Al-Maliki mentions this. People say the Prophet ordered all the black dogs to die. He said, what an ignorant person. He said, the Prophet, and now it makes sense, ordered the black dogs to be killed because there was a group of rapid dogs in Medina who just happened to be what? Black. Kill them. But he said it was not an order to kill every single black dog on the face of the earth. He said when the companions of the prophet went out to make jihad, you have never heard that they stopped, you know, in front of a dog kennel and said, Ya Allah, hayya bina, nathbah al-kilab. So he said this is considered a specific situation because he says, listen to the beauty of his argument. The norm is for a Muslim not to harm animals. So he said, actually invert it and understand that, again, there was a circumstance that demanded the norm be ignored, if you will, and in place for a greater benefit for people. So we'll, we'll talk about that body of history and how scholars, what instruments did they use to come to these conclusions? And what I'm finding in our communities today is, is acute ignorance, such that ignorance has now become knowledge and knowledge has become ignorant. How many qualified American imams have come back to America and not been able to keep their job for longer than one year? One of them is a very good friend of mine, uh, the first American to attain a master's degree in a major institution overseas. And I'm hearing the same complaint, and that is our congregations are saying we are too liberal. We are too easygoing. I said, La, antumul fuqaha. You are scholars. You have qualified yourself. But a community that refuses, right, to listen to, I would say, responsible scholarship out of its own internal fears because of cultural issues and civilization and, it, you know, realities like colonialism. We're in trouble because many of these talented young men are leaving the field of imam and driving taxis or working for banks. And when we lose our children, we can blame ourselves for that. The last thing that we'll try to address, and in included this how the, fat, how the role of fatwa came out, are certain axioms that really should guide our artistic creativity. We need to respect the power of cultural icons. It's a transcendent power. I sat down with most deaf one time, and he looked at me like he thought I was going to pound him. I said, look, Ak. Ak means brother. It's our American slang thing. I said, look, Aki, you have a minbar. I have a minbar. You have congregants. I have congregants. You know how best how to speak to yours. I know how the best to speak to mine. Just keep doing what you got to do. He's like, I can't. Like, wow, you said that to me? So let's take a number of beautiful principles. For example, the Prophet that Here's a good one. That there's no debating about what you name something. You know, am I a convert or a revert? Can we stop 
Hashtag nobody cares. <laughs> Hashtag nobody cares was done on purpose to show you how culture shapes how you appreciate the point. Right? There's always something going on in the background here. Be careful. Hashtag nobody cares, B. Right? Because there's no, why would the ulama, we'll talk about this tomorrow in the six principles that surround this axiom, why would the scholars empower us? Why do the Pakistani brothers and sisters say, Qud? Nobody says, no, it's Allah. But if we say, you know, in the name of God, the most gracious, the most merciful, peace and blessings be upon God's messenger, undoubtedly, after the khutbah, I'll walk outside and there'll be some red-faced dude sitting in the parking lot. He's like, I want to talk to you right now. You're destroying our religion. But, brother, I just gave a khutbah. I didn't destroy the religion. No, you said God. Could I have us? God could have us. That's Persian, brother. So why would the ulama empower us to not worry about what you name it, man? But what do you mean by what you say? What does it have to deal with marketing and the tipping point and Caldwell and the arts in our community and how we speak to people? Why would God say, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ وَمَا أَرْسَلْ مِنْ رَسُولٍ إِلَّا بِلِسَانِ قَوْمِ We did not send a messenger except he spoke the language of the people. Now watch this. Language is, is majaz. It's a rhetorical usage because that would imply that the only thing God sent them with was with a tongue. But actually it means إِلَّا بِثِقَافَتِهِمْ Except with their culture. But he mentions speech in isolation to highlight its fundamental importance to the universal at hand. Just like you say chicken biryani, right? It's already in the biryani, why you got to say chicken separately? To highlight its importance. So why do you have to talk about speech vis-a-vis -vis culture? Because speech is so central to the message, especially for a prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So branding. There was a study done by a neoconservative think tank that said Muslims don't get it. They put Islam on everything. They just don't get it. They put Islam on everything. You know, and you see Muslim orgs. I'm saying this with all respect. Make sure you put our name on there. Make sure you put our name all over it. You know, people don't like, in America, a reality is we don't like people who are ostentatious. We might not be the most religious community in the world, but we don't like people who front with religion. Real talk, right? Where's the implicit da'wah? Where's the marketing strategy to bring people into a community? Another thing that we'll talk about as I finish is how do we understand what is unassailable in our deen? What's unassailable? What has to be respected as completely, completely as it is? And I would say that in many ways we, we, we mirror the society we live. America is not a monolith. There are aspects of American society that change, but the universal basically stays the same. When a bunch of people see children being killed in a the school, they're moved ethically, but it's a universal reality. Freedom, transparency, although it's negotiated and been negotiated and certain realities have played out that not everyone has been the beneficiary of that. As we talked about today, ML King's message to the Muslim would be that you need to stand up for minorities because you are a minority and I'm a minority when I accepted Islam, a religious minority, and that we need to stand up for the oppressed even though we are recipients of opulence. Yeah, we should feel somehow responsible for the opulence that God has given us to make sure that we make shukr to God and speak to power when it's unbridled. That will be a message that MLK would have for post 9-11 Muslims who have simply drunk the Kool-Aid all the time. Right? And then the other extreme is those who, you know, Kafirs, forget this country, man. Why are you living here, man? Grab a ticket and bounce. I'll buy you one. Just get out of my masjid. Right? Two extremes. So there is not assimilation, because that's going to happen on its own, whether we like it or not. But there is participation, but critical participation. So as Muslims, as I finish, what do we have to keep sacred? But what is it allowable for our scholars to interpret for us? And what would be the goal of that interpretation? And why? Because interpretation is a natija. 
and that natija has agrad. You know, interpretation is a goal that is, has certain objectives behind it. What are those objectives? Not that they're scholars for dollars or sellouts or that they have nefarious or intentions or that she wants to. No, there's a system of instruments employed that cause that music to play. And that takes us to what we'll look at. We'll look at music as an example. Because the arts and this society are something that we cannot sleep on any longer. And I'll finish with an example on an asif. I was in the masjid in Boston. A 17-year-old Puerto Rican sister came to the masjid. Mashallah, brothers know. Came to the masjid, I know how it is. I put up a picture that a Brazilian sister accepted Islam, 25,000 likes. Although she was 50 years old. I said, brothers, please stop having these negative thoughts about women. And vice versa, I put up a picture of a brother who was Italian who accepted Islam. My phone started blowing up like the 4th of July, man. With all respect to all cultures and not to offend anyone. But that, you know, unfortunately is the case. She came to the masjid, she's 17, wonderful girl, doesn't speak any English, man. No English. Sits down in front of me and says, Piquito, Piquito, English, man. I said, all right, well, this is going to be interesting. I said to her, and we hired an ED in our masjid who speaks Spanish on purpose. Princeton guy, Marshall Scholar. Sits down with her, starts speaking Spanish, says, I want to become Muslim. I said, how on earth did this girl found out about Islam? You know, in America, she doesn't speak English. Said one thing to me, Maher Zain. I said, Maher Zain? He's married too. Maher Zain. Maher Zain. I said, what do you mean? She said, I like music. And I listen to his songs. And his message in Spanish, resonated with me. And I want to be Muslim now. 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 I said, are you sure we have Islam on one? No, I got Mahazain. <laughs> so I, this is the first Spanish Shahada I ever gave. One day, my phone rings. Brother from the Bay Area. Also, nice no, single. Married, inshallah soon. The barrier calls me up. Say, are you, are you Imam Suhaib Web? Say, yeah, who is this? Eight o'clock in the morning. Brother, what you call me eight o'clock in the morning for, man? He said, I got your phone number from an MSA uh, student here at San Francisco State. I want to accept Islam on the phone. On the phone? I said, listen, why don't you come to my office? No, I want to do it now. I said, subhanAllah, that's Iman. I mean, that's Iman, right? And I said, why? He said, lasers. Lupe's album, Lupe's Fiasco's third album, it's called Lasers. So, I, of course, I was like, you're talking about lasers on the phone? I'm an imam. I don't know what you're talking about, bro. <laughs> lasers, I don't know anything about lasers, brother. And forgive me earlier for the examples if I offended anyone culturally. That wasn't my intention, by the way. So he said to me, lasers. I said, oh, that those lasers. Right. He said, I listened to Lupe's album. The man speaks the truth. And he, because of him, I read the Quran. Because of him, I want to become Muslim. Because of what he talks about, I want to accept Islam. The arts are able to climb fences that the mimbar can never climb. Create, the, the arts are the language of lovers, but it's just a different language. And we have an assumption about arts because we have not been exposed to a rich tradition. If I quote to you what Ibn Abdu'l-Bar said about music, you make a blog post about me tonight. Ibn Abdu'l-Bar said that music was the sole study of scholars in the early days. That scholars engaged in the study of music in Spain. Why would he say that? Would we say that Al-Hafiz Ibn Abdu'l-Bar is Mubtadi? A'udhu Billah. So we need to engage what has happened to us at an educational construction level. Why do we think the way that we think? And that will bring me into the last point. That I believe, as a hypothesis, that American Islam is criticized in a way that no other form of Islam is criticized. And that American du'at and especially the white ones, 
are put on blast in a way that reflects a hatred for American culture. Not something that's rooted, I believe, in a real academic discourse. I say this, if people of color in the Muslim community are subjected to an implicit racism, explicit racism, excuse me, then the white convert is subjected to an implicit racism. More so maybe than others, because many in the community, and I say this with respect, and I want you to think about what I'm saying, don't get emotional mad at me. And as a white dude, I'm kind of uncomfortable saying it, but you got to say it. Because if you don't, you can't sleep at night. And that is that the white convert is held up, and I say this with all respect, to notions and definitions of whiteness within the immigrant community and other communities. That perhaps the definition is, you know, Bob Hope. You know, all white guys should be like, well, I'm here to talk about God. Ha! Huh? Or maybe Will Ferrell. May Allah protect us. But we have definitions because in many ways we idealize that universal. It's become a hidden shirk, which you talked about before. So what happens when the white dude is dropping street slang, you know, got his pants sagging, you know, went to an inner city high school, and he doesn't or she doesn't fall into the definition of whiteness held up by the community. And that's why Sheikh Hamza, Hafizahullah, we saw after 9-11, Islam Online, and I wrote him a letter about this. What was the article that they had about Sheikh Hamza? Who remembers what it was called? What? The Great White Hope. We're talking about a fellow Muslim like this? And no one said anything. Because you know why? Because of what I alluded to earlier. I mean, that's disgusting. And I had white converts coming to me saying, you know, I don't, I don't think they like us. I, I, don't, I don't think, I know Salam Sheikh, we we'll say Salam to Dr. Munir. I don't, I don't think they like us. I don't think we've been fully accepted, even though th that white convert might not have agreed with Sheikh Hamza. But the fact that race was used to criticize Sheikh Hamza, Hafizullah, post 9-11, to me indicated that some in the community, I didn't say all, الحكم على الجميع لا يمكن, that some in the community have this virus. Now, I'm not going to talk about the other side of the coin. You wrote a book about it. People can buy it and read it and listen to you talk about it. But I believe that that also has fractured our ability to truly engage in an American Muslim discourse. And I believe, and this is what we'll talk about over the weekend, inshallah, that it's a necessity. And if other people don't want to do it, that's fine. But leave those who do alone. Let them build, and you build. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, yuwafiqana wa iyaakum, wa sallallahu ala sayyidina muhammadin, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Takbir. You can clap too. See, and I, and I did that on purpose as well, just as Imam, said, uh, Imam Suhaib was mentioning earlier. By the way, uh, Imam Suhaib was talking about that moment in history when Omar became Muslim, when, and there's no comparison between the two, we're not comparing them as he said. When Magic Johnson made that announcement, he, made, he had AIDS. When Imam Suhaib, when the word got out that he's going to Azhar, it was that same kind of buzz. It was that same kind of buzz across America. And alhamdulillah, we, have, uh, we are yani, alhamdulillah, blessed that Imam Suhaib came back with a full, uh, with a full, uh, with a full load. And mashallah, and he really opened the doors. I was talking in the morning with Imam Suhaib about one of the first Azhari graduates from America, Imam uh, Sheikh Hassan Tawfiq from the, west, uh, from the East Coast. And then... The sister of Malcolm X, Ella Collins, and how she sent 65 people from the African American community, the newly founded Orthodox Muslim African American community, to go study in Egypt. 
And so, alhamdulillah, we are seeing the fruits and the products coming 50 years later in the likes of Imam Suhaib and many others, uh, inshallah, coming up on his heels. Zakum Allah khairan for those beautiful words. And I was thinking about something you said, and you're talking about how certain concepts, they repeat over different periods of time. I was on the freeway for about four hours today, so I was going crazy. I was up since Fajr, tired out of my mind, flipping through channels. Listen to Stevie Wonder. Listen to this. Dr. Jackson and Imam Suhaib will know what I'm talking about. I don't know if anybody else in the audience will. When he said in the line, he said, um, he said, I wish those days would come back once more. And I was thinking that's a concept that repeats throughout history. Layta shababu ya'uda yawman. Ya'uda yawman. You know, that may, we wish that we would go back to those days when we were once uh, young once again. So some of these contracts, uh, that was just an interesting point that he brought up and I thought I'd bring that up as well. We want to um, move to our next uh, honored and distinguished guest, um, Dr. Sherman Jackson. Dr. Sherman Jackson is the king. I'm sorry. Dr. Germ Sherman Jackson is the King Faisal Chair of Islamic Thought and, Chil and Culture. Sometimes you have to uh, disobey the leadership. <laughs> and Professor of Religion and American Studies and Ethnicity at the University of Southern California, USC. We are greatly honored that he joined the greater Los Angeles community about a year ago. He received his PhD at the University of Pennsylvania and has taught at many different universities at the University of Texas in Austin, Indiana University and the University of Michigan. He's the author of several books, um, including one of his latest ones, uh, Sufism for Non-Sufis, Ibn Atallah's Al-Askandri Taj Al-Arus, and other books. Um, and he is one of the core scholars of the Alim program, Dr. Sherman Jackson. <coughs> and Dr. Sherman Jackson, mashallah, these brothers up here have a lot of passion and energy Dr. Sherman Jackson has a lot more than uh, Imam Suhaib, so we're going to give him the, the headset so he doesn't... No, nah, I'll be all right. Huh? Nah, I can't do this. Nah, this is, nah, this is too much technology for me. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah, nasta'inahu wa nasta'khfiru wa nasta'hadih. Wa na'udhu billahi min shururi anfusina min sayyati a'malina. Min yahdi la fala mudilla lah. Wa man yulni fala hadiya lah. وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبد ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل لقطة من لساني يفقه قولي وقني شر نفسي وفلت لساني وأن أضل أؤذل 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 بغير حق رب العالمين وبعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته I want to preface my remarks by saying uh, how honored I am to uh, to be here uh, and uh, how appreciative I am uh, to the community here for opening your doors to uh, to the island program and uh, on that note I also want to second something that uh, Imam Suhaib said uh, relative to uh, the role of uh, people like uh, Dr. Mazama Siddiqui um, and I'm saying this uh, not as a sort of crass gesture uh, of uh, false flattery. But uh, in the context of uh, an increasing uh, historical consciousness uh, that I acquire as I get older, um, people like Dr. Mazammil um, probably uh, have no idea uh, of uh, all of the people that they have touched over the many years that they have been in operation. Um, I'm someone who goes back uh, over 30 years uh, to the early days uh, of the ISNA conferences um, where people like Dr. Muzammil uh, was inspiring us to ourselves or reach for higher heights and deeper understandings. And while we may not have always understood or perhaps even agreed with what we were hearing, the very opportunity to witness commitment to Islam in action was something that was very deeply inspiring. And um, I, I really want to say that, um, you know, it's, it's very 
common among Muslims that we honor our, our Salaf, uh, our ancestors, um, but somehow our ancestors cannot be people who function and operate within our own midst. Um, we have our ancestors too, and we are standing on the shoulders of people who dedicated and sacrificed a lot to build what we have so far. And I just want to be one of those persons uh, who acknowledges that and uh, who invites you to acknowledge that. And I hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bless us all with a deeper sense of historical consciousness so that we can understand our role relative to those who came before us as well as those who are coming after us. After all, that is ultimately what a community is all about. Um, I want to be, inshallah, very brief in my remarks. Um, and I want to try and give a sense of what I hope to be able to articulate uh, over the weekend. Um, and I'm going to be talking about the whole issue of the challenge uh, of culture and the sociocultural reality that we are confronted with in America. And the fact that we can ignore that reality, but we cannot avoid it. That reality will affect us one way or the other. And either we will arrive at a point where we can exercise cultural agency, and ultimately, hopefully, some cultural authority, which I'll talk about in just a minute, or we will find ourselves in a position where our religious sensibilities are diluted, are weakened, are emaciated in ways that we are not even aware of because we are living in a social atmosphere, a social cultural climate that basically makes religion feel irrelevant as an aspect of everyday life. And I know that this kind of talk is not very popular among a lot of people, but let me just say this. I'm not here to talk about reality as we would like it to be. I'm here to talk about reality as it is. And especially among some of our parents, if you think this is not a reality, well, your children may not share it with you, they share it with me. And I encounter it far more often than I would like to. Um, I want to try and sort of contextualize my marks by um, sort of sharing, you, sharing with you a, an experience that I recently had. Um, I, uh, I just came back from a, a, a trip overseas, and um, part of that was, took me to Saudi Arabia. And in, uh, in Saudi Arabia, uh, I had the, the pleasure and the honor of uh, meeting with another uh, uh, old uh, uh, stalwart in trying to establish Islamic institutions in America, uh, Dr. Uh, Abdul Hamid Abu Suleiman. Uh, I met with him uh, in the Riyadh. And uh, he, he gave me uh, a bunch of uh, books and things that, that he had written. And um, one in particular sort of caught my attention. And so I, I, I began to, uh, to read it. And the title of this book was uh, Azmatul Aql al Muslim, um, The Crisis of, of the Muslim Mind. And in this book, um, he basically talked about the major problem of the Muslim world being the problem of political autonomy, political authenticity, and political efficiency the ability to construct a political reality that is effective and at the same time reflects the rules, the sensibilities, the values, the principles of Islam. And that in their quest to achieve this, Muslims had been either overly enamored with importing solutions from abroad, that is, Western ways of, of, of doing things, or overly 
romantic in their attachment to their own tradition in a way that they imagined that people who lived centuries ago in the context of realities that are far, far removed from the realities that they are now living today, imagining that those people could actually proffer concrete solutions for the kinds of issues that they confronted in life. And the result of this was that Muslim society um, became more stagnant, more alienated, more dependent, and these approaches to things actually made things worse. And that in all of the years of these modern experiments, none of these attempts to sort of patchwork a solution together had actually, had actually worked. And basically what he was arguing is that we need an authentic approach that is a spontaneous reading of our sources as applied to our reality. One in which we exercise agency and responsibility. And nothing short of that will work. Now I found this book to be interesting on a number of levels. But to be honest with you, what was even more sort of important for me is that to a very real extent, you know, as I read and read and read more in the book, I kept saying to myself, but that's not our issue. That's not our issue. Here in the West where we live in America, our issue is not one of how we are going to construct a government. Certainly not today. That's not our issue. Our issue is not one of how we are going to construct and run a national economy. That may be an issue 200 years or 100 years, 25 years from now. But that's not our issue today. Our issue is not who's going to pick up the trash tomorrow, here. These are issues that are already in place. And for us to remain focused on those issues will have the effect of blinding us to the real issues that confront us. And the real issues that confront us are issues that have to do with how we can effectively define ourselves as Muslims and how we can gain public recognition for our own self-definition as Muslims in this country. Will we be defined by others and therefore live in the light of their definitions in which case we either react against them or we react in such a way that we actually embrace their definitions or will we define ourselves will we say this is what Islam is this is who we are as Muslims and we want public respect for our own self-definition of who we are as Muslims. And all this focus on the obsessions of the Muslim world, as legitimate as they are, blinds us to our own reality and our own challenges that we have to confront here. So much so that I began to think that Perhaps we in America may be guilty of the same thing that Abu Suleiman was talking about the Muslim world doing in reverse. He was talking about how the Muslim world had suffered from its tendency to borrow imported solutions instead of proffering its own. We too in America may be suffering from the same thing. 
of trying to borrow imported solutions. Solutions that come from places that don't necessarily understand our reality. And in fact, I had some of the same experiences that you had uh, in Egypt. I remember I was, uh, <laughs> I, was uh, I won't say any names, uh, I was studying with a, with a sheikh and uh, I said to him, I'll give you the first name, I said to him, I said, Sheikh Ahmed, you, you know, one of our problems in America is some of these fatwas you guys keep sending over there. And he was an older man, uh, older than me. I'm not that old. But he was an older man, and I say that to say that, you know, he was more secure. He wasn't threatened. By, by what I had said. And then he said to me, Sheikh Abdul Hakim, we're going to stay your problem until you proffer your own fatwas for your own reality. Now, I got a problem, he said. I'm on this Islam online thing. And I got these ladies from America and England sending me these questions about marriage and divorce and all this stuff. I want you to help me answer them. Because you know their reality in ways that I do not. And if I answer them on the basis of an understanding that emerges out of my social cultural context, I might do these ladies a lot of harm. All right? And so what I'm talking about is the fact that we in America have to understand that we will have to be the people who exercise agency and taking control of our own destiny and our own future here. And while we may benefit from ideas, from knowledge, from insights that come from elsewhere, we will ultimately have to be the people who determine what the utility of those, of those insights, of that knowledge, of those solutions are. And we as a community, we have to stop being cowards and we have to stop being lazy. We have to stop being cowards and we have to stop being lazy. As if someone else is going to go through all of the agony, all of the sacrifice, all of the hard work. To do what? Tell us how to live. Raise our children. Not their own, ours. One of the things that we have to run, understand as Muslims in America, and I, I, I want to say this parenthetically, um, as you listen to what I say, please don't make the mistake <clears throat> of imagining that everything that we face here is gloom and doom. It is not. And part of what concerns me is that by always focusing on problems and problems alone, oftentimes we overlook the many opportunities that we have, and as a result thereof, we forfeit opportunities. Right? And so we have to be big-minded. We have to be circumspect. But we have to understand that we we, this community, will have to work to ensure its own future. And I want to I share with you an insight that, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> that's often lost on us as a community because we are a, a minority community um, in a majoritarian non-Muslim society. And that oftentimes presents us with a sort of psychological barrier that is so thick that it almost gives us an excuse not to even try. That, that, that the odds are so great that all we can do is sort of find some sort of holding pattern and just hope um, that we will survive, that our children will remain Muslim, and things will turn out all right. I want to remind us of something here that contrary to what many of us 
may, and, and many of us won't acknowledge this openly, but because we have very little intellectual authority in the world, it's almost as if what the West says about Islam is true. And even when we reject it with our tongues, some of us accept it with our hearts. And one of the, 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 the ideas that has been generated about Islam is this whole business of it spreading by the sword. And many of us in our sort of triumphalism, we sort of like that. We like the idea that, you know, Muslims were able to amass so much power that nobody was able to resist them. MashaAllah, Allahu Akbar. But the reality is, is that those lands that form the central lands of the Muslim world today, these are places that did not become a simple majority Muslim for centuries. For centuries. And did not become places like Egypt, places like Iraq, places like Syria, places like Iran, and did not become overwhelmingly Muslim for about 300 years. So, in a sense, not quite, but in a sense, you might imagine that, you know, America is how old? Thank you. 236, around that. America's, let's say, 200 years old. All right? What we have to recognize is that if you were sitting in Egypt 200 years after Islam came to Egypt, all right, as Muslims, you would still have been a minority in Egypt. You would still have been a minority in Syria. You would still have been a minority in Iraq. Hmm? Hmm? When did Imam Abu Hanifa die? What year? Anybody know? One, 150. I said what? 150. What do you think the percentage of Muslims in Iraq was in the year 150? When he died, not when he was living and doing his thing. When he died, what do you think the percentage of Muslims could have been? 20, 30 percent? Hmm? That's, that's, pretty, that's pretty high for that time. When did Imam Shafi'i die? 204. When did Malik die? 179. When did Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal die? 241. Even among the Shiites, Imam Jafar al-Sadiq was one of the teachers of Malik in Hadith. So he died before Malik. What's the point that I'm making here? Our a'imma, those who produce some of the greatest repositories of religious knowledge in the history of Islam, did so as minorities. I got, I got, I got minority time here. <laughs> the, the, the point that I'm making here is that we should not allow ourselves to be disabused of the confidence that we can do it. Because that is what generates and perpetuates laziness and half-heartedness. Those men and women back there who laid the foundations for an Islamic civilization, they worked hard. And they believed in the power of the miraculous. That if they worked hard and if they dedicated themselves they could be touched by the grace and the mercy of God and great things could happen. We have to retrieve that, that sense among ourselves. And the one thing that we have to understand, automatic pilot will not do it. Automatic pilot will not do it. We have, in my estimation, five major challenges as a Muslim community living in America. Can I have two extra minutes? Because it's going to take just two, inshallah. And I say this, you know, both as an academic and as somebody who's tried to parlay 
their academic training into something that's useful for my Muslim community for 30 years. The first major challenge we have is the challenge of epistemology. I know that's a fancy word. Let me try and break it down. Part of the problem that we have now, and the people in this room are going to be most affected by this. Part of the problem that we are confronting now is that one of the symbols of success in America is to be able to get married, raise children, and send them where? To college. And send them to college. But the American Academy today is increasingly reflective of a secularizing and perhaps even atheizing uh, hmm? psychological framework, epistemology. And what we are doing is we are sending our ch and by the way, the, the more prestigious the school you send your kid to, huh? the, the more concentrated that secularizing mentality is. And we're sending our children to these schools for four years, for six years, for eight years. They're being saturated with this mindset in the context of which religion doesn't make any sense. And then they're coming out the other side and being expected to reconcile Islam with themselves. And this is beginning to cause dislocations now. And what we need as a Muslim community, we need to develop the antidote to this. We need to develop the antidote to this. We need alternative institutions. We need places where our best and brightest can go and address these issues. And here I want to make an appeal. And I hope I'm not misunderstood here. I have a job. I have a house. I have a car. I have a wife. I don't need your money. But those of us who are wealthy in the Muslim community, and I mean wealthy, we have to understand that we are at the point where we need to put it on the line. Do you ever, you ever ask yourself, let's see, Ghazali, was he a great scholar? Hey, where are we? Was Ibn Taymiyyah a great scholar? Was Qaddafi a great scholar? You ever ask yourself, where do these people come from? You ever ask yourself that? Where do they come from? Were they born scholars? How did they become scholars? There were institutions. But get this. There was no ministry of education. There was no board of education. Where did those institutions come from? Private, not masajid, private individuals came forth and put it on the line. Put it on the line. I'm not a scholar. I'm a millionaire businessman. That's what I do. I can't give fatwas, but I can write checks. And I hope that they will be waiting for me on the day of judgment. Many of you may have heard, have you heard, have you seen that report, Fear Inc.? Anybody ever heard of that? There was a report done in 2009. Some Muslims did it uh, with the Center for American. I can't remember. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Anyway, there was a report. And the report said that from between 2001 and 2009, Islamophobic causes in this country, right? There were only seven foundations that they cited. Seven. Hmm? And those seven foundations contributed 42.6% million dollars to Islamophobia. That is part of what we're up against in America. And if we're going to be able to develop alternative epistemologies, because see, if you're a young, I'm an academic, I'm in the classroom, and I know 
if you are a young person sitting in the university today and you believe in God, whether you're Christian, Jewish, or whatever, you got something to answer for. If you don't believe in God, you don't have anything to answer for. That's a reality. How long do we think our children are going to survive this? How long? So that's the first challenge we have to confront. The second challenge is, you know, there's some theological issues that we have to address. Because these are the issues that undermine religion in this society. The first issue is the issue of theodicy. Every, when uh, these, these uh, 20 children got killed at this school, all right, you hear it from time to time. What do people say? Where was God? How can this happen? Wait, where is God? And it's happening all the time. All right? And we can come here in our masjid and feel secure. And we can ignore this. But your children have to go to school tomorrow. They got to go to school. My 16-year-old daughter has to wear hijab to a public school the next day. Where they're saying what? Where was God? These are issues. We, we have to address this issue. All right? Because it will undermine religion. It's undermined major aspects of religion in the West. We now live in the West. It's not going to stop all of a sudden at our doorstep. We have to address this. The third issue, I'm going to hurry up. Or maybe I should skip it. The third issue is this. See, we have to understand that living in the West, you see, most of the people in this room may not think of themselves as Western. And that's fine. Uh, that, that's perfectly fine. But just because you aren't Western, you live in the West now, Western history is your history. Because you are living realities that emerge out of that history. And one of the realities is this. That religion in the West was a problem.